Hello, and welcome to the first edition of Nelson Mullen's 2021 Education Law Webinar Series. We're glad you could join us today. My name is Dan Cohen, and I'm a partner on Nelson Mullen's Education Law team. Nelson Mullins is an AmLaw 100 firm with about 800 attorneys and policy advisors across 25 offices in 11 states plus Washington, D.C. Among other practices, we have a dedicated team of attorneys focused on serving all legal needs of educational institutions, including in the areas of labor and employment, healthcare and academic medical programs, construction and real estate, intellectual property, privacy and information security, and especially unique issues that affect education institutions like student and faculty discipline, sexual misconduct, and athletics. As we did last year, we host free monthly webinars addressing legal topics across all of these areas, and sometimes more frequently as issues arise. Last year, we focused on schools' rapidly evolving legal needs in the face of COVID challenges, how to handle the rollout of the Trump administration's new Title IX regulations, and many other topics. In 2021, we've planned an exciting series of free webinars starting today. Our future topics will include disability and workforce accommodations after COVID adjusted our expectations about in-person services, campus protests, race, and the First Amendment, the Biden administration's expected response on new Title IX sexual miscon misconduct, and several other topics. Please feel free to contact one of our education lawyers if you have any questions about our webinars or any other legal issue affecting your educational institution. And if you have ideas for future webinar topics, please let us know uh, by utilizing the question or the feedback form during or after today's webinar. Uh, today, Nina Gupta and Sherry Colvis are going to focus on mandating masks, testing, and vaccines at schools and colleges in the age of COVID-19. Uh, COVID How far can we go in mandating compliance with these safety measures? Nina Gupta focuses her practice on education law, representing public and private educational entities, vendors, and professionals. She is the current general counsel to Atlanta Public Schools, a large urban school district serving over 50,000 students. She works directly with governing boards and education leaders to promote effective policy development and compliance. She focuses her practice on providing legal advice to education clients in the areas of disability and discrimination law, employment matters, Title IX, regulatory compliance, and litigation. Sherry Colvis is a partner at Nelson Mullins with over 20 years of experience in the areas of education law, as well as employment law and related litigation. She represents numerous institutions of higher education, school districts, charter schools, and education-related vendors. She focuses on supporting these education-related clients in the areas of regulatory compliance, employment law, and legal issues involving students with disabilities. And with that, I will turn it over to Nina and Sherry. Thanks very much, Dan, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, we have a lot of information to cover. We're gonna cover it pretty quickly, um, but please know that this webinar is being recorded and it is gonna be available for you to review after we finish. Um, so today we're gonna be addressing the legal considerations involved in decisions by schools and colleges to mandate masks, testing, and vaccinations related to COVID-19. We're also going to address liability and immunity protections under the PREP Act. That is an acronym, we'll get to that and what all that stands for, as well as confidentiality provisions that govern all of this. We're gonna be looking at this both from the angle of students and employees. What can you do with regards to students? What can you do with regards to your employees? And we're also going to address any distinctions that are necessary for public K-12 schools versus private K-12 schools or public and private colleges and universities. Our guidance is based on federal law and prevailing trends. Now, of course, as with any legal issue, your local and state laws, as well as guidance from your local health department will need to be consulted. Um, we also recognize that many schools and colleges were, will decide to adopt programs where masks or testings or vaccinations are, quote, strongly encouraged rather than mandated or required. This webinar is gonna help you understand the legal considerations in that approach, but we are focused today on how far you can go and whether these um, strategies of masks, testing, and vaccinations can be mandated. So let's start with masks. Um, so the consensus is pretty clear that wearing masks or face coverings um, is the most easily accessible and most effective way to stop the spread of coronavirus. No one likes wearing one, myself included, but they seem to work. Um, and that consensus um, has led many schools to consider mask mandates for their students, their faculty and staff, as well as visitors. As a general proposition, schools, colleges, and universities do have the authority 
to control what happens on their property and events that they control. So in addition to your campus buildings, um, think about your athletic events or tournaments or your prom, that kind of thing. Consistent with that authority, schools can also require that any individual, faculty, staff, student, volunteers, parents, community members who access their property or attend a school event must wear a mask um, during those times. In addition, you're gonna want to consult your state and local laws or ordinances as well. Some states and cities have issued their own mask mandates that apply to schools. So that decision will have been made for you if that's the case. Other states and cities have left those decisions around masks to the individual schools and individual institutions. Keep in mind also that CDC guidelines around masks stress the importance of correct mask usage. Um, I think we've all gotten the memo by now that the mask needs to cover the mouth and the nose. Um, and more recently, the CDC has also stressed the importance of masks fitting snugly against the face. And that tight fit can be achieved with a nose wire or a mask brace or nodding ear loops or even double masking where you wear a disposable surgical mask and then put a cloth mask over it. Um, now it's probably not logistically feasible for schools to consistently enforce absolutely correct mask usage at all times and to police that consistently, but any mask is generally better than no mask at all to stop the spread of coronavirus. And simply having a mask mandate in and of itself is going to go a long way towards ensuring that everyone who enters your school's property or your school's event is going to be wearing a mask. Now, if you choose to have a mask mandate, there's some uh, considerations you need to allow for, and I'm gonna toss it to Sherry to talk about some of those. Good ever afternoon, everybody. This is Sherry Colvis, and I'm gonna start by talking with y'all about some of the considerations you need to keep in mind when mandating masks as it relates to your disabled um, employees and your students. But as I talk about these disability considerations and accommodations, really understand that they're gonna also apply when you consider mandating testing or vaccines. In general, if your school or college can demonstrate that wearing a mask is an essential requirement due to the health and safety of your workforce and your school environment, and that granting an exception to that would cause an undue hardship, then you can generally require that your employees wear a mask. Uh, as Nina said, you should ensure that you're consulting the most recent guidelines that are available from your local health department and from the CDC. And you should also take into consideration your local community transmission numbers in making those decisions. Uh, as you roll out a mandatory mask program, make sure that you are treating all of your similarly situated employees the same. And what I mean by that is if one department mandates a mask and the other department does not, you're probably going to have a hard time defending that it was mandatory and that you had a reason to discipline or remove an employee who didn't wear their mask in the particular department that did mandate it. Unless, of course, there was a really rational reason for the difference in the way that the departments handled the situation. Now, if you have an employee who comes to you and says that they cannot wear a mask because they have a disability, then you are gonna need to follow the ADA's interactive process for determining if there is a reasonable accommodation for that employee. This is the same process that you would follow in any other situation where an employee needed an accommodation as a result of a disability. So let's break that down and talk about what that looks like. First, you can and you should require that your employee provide you with medical documentation explaining why they cannot wear a mask. You should ask your employee questions. Ask them, what type of an accommodation are they requesting? Don't just assume that you know the answer to this. They may not be asking for a full relief from wearing the mask. They may be only asking for breaks. Um, you should probe into how legitimate of a request is this? Is the employee wearing a mask to go to the grocery store, to go to restaurants or go shopping? If they are, then there may be a reasonable reason to assume they can wear it at work, right? 
Um, also ask the employee and ask their doctor, can the employee never wear a mask or do they need just to have breaks from wearing the mask, uh, limitations on how long they can wear the mask, or relief from wearing the mask when they're doing certain types of activities like uh, being outside or, you know, more rigorous activities such as exercising. After you're done doing that, explore what type of reasonable accommodations uh, might be appropriate. You know, um, is the employee always going to be around other individuals and coming into close contact with others, or are they going to be in a, a more isolated environment? For example, are we talking about a professor or a teacher who's teaching a class, somebody who's in a cubicle situation in a communal office environment? Or are we talking about somebody who really doesn't interact much with their coworkers or your student body? That may help you determine how to approach the answer. Is your school or college permitting some of the teachers or faculty members to teach remotely? Certainly, we all know that there are some schools that are offering both in-person and remote learning modules for students. And some of those schools are taking volunteers for employees that may wish to teach a group of students remotely. If that's your situation, then one approach is to offer an accommodation by allowing the employee to be part of the group that is teaching remotely. Now, of course, that does not work for everybody, and we have several colleges and schools that we represent that are not able to provide a remote work option for their employees. If that's the case, again, ask yourself, does this employee need to be in this building at the same time as others, or do they happen to have a job position that can be restructured when they can perform their work, for example, in the afternoon or the evening when the building is otherwise vacated or significantly less populated? If you come to the end of your analysis and your interactive process with the employee and their doctor, and there is not another reasonable accommodation for the employee, they truly cannot wear a mask to work, and, you know, it would be an undue hardship for you to relieve them from that, one accommodation is to allow them to be placed on leave, either paid or unpaid, depending on your situation, and hold the job for them until they are able to come to work with a mask on or the mask requirement has been lifted for your campus. I want to turn for a moment and talk about students and disabilities and accommodations that we may need to consider for those folks as we deal with mandatory mask requirements, but also keep this in mind as we proceed through testing and vaccinations. Now, how this is going to work for students will vary some depending on whether you are a private or a public K-12 school or whether you are a college or university. For private schools that receive no federal funding, you have the most liberties in your decision making. As a private property owner or if you lease your property, you can set the requirements for individuals that enter your premises. This is why when you go to Target or the grocery store, they can mandate that you wear masks. For public K-12 schools, you have more considerations at play. If you have a student that is a special education student and has an IEP, or if you have a student with a disability who has a 504 plan, then you are going to have to continue providing that student with a free and appropriate public education that we all know is FAPE. Therefore, if you refuse access to the traditional school environment because the student cannot wear a mask, you are going to need to make sure that you are still providing that student with FAPE. And we could have another seminar that would take up an entire day on what that looks like, but as you all know, that can be very challenging, especially for our more significantly disabled student population. At the college level, while you don't have to worry about the IDEA or providing students with a free and appropriate public education, you are still going to have to comply with Section 504 and its non-discrimination requirements. Section 504 applies to public K-12 schools as well. 
So let's talk about what Section 504 and its equal access non-discrimination requirements uh, require. In short, before you refuse entry to your campus for a student with a disability who cannot wear a mask, you must determine, like with your employees, if there is a reasonable accommodation that can be made. Again, you can consider alternatives to mask wearing that might include options such as remote learning or mask breaks. Um, additionally, you know, we obviously are watching the vaccination program being rolled out. If at some point in the future, healthcare providers can demonstrate that those individuals who have been vaccinated cannot transmit COVID, then one of the options that you may have, not yet, but in the future, could be the option of allowing these folks to come on campus once vaccinated. Again, we're not there yet in our science, but I would keep my eye on that. If there are no accommodations that will satisfy the health and safety concerns of your school or college, then you can probably exclude that student from on-campus activities, but you must ensure that you are treating everyone equally. And again, you must remember your faith obligations if you're K-12 public schools. What this means is that you've got to make sure that all of your individuals, and that means faculty, staff, other students, are all being required to follow the same rules. You can't exclude a student from campus for not wearing a mask if you're permitting the faculty to take their masks off, right? And while this has not been uh, played out yet in the court cases, we would advise that you work extra hard to reasonably accommodate those students who can truly demonstrate that their breathing would be obstructed if they were forced to wear a mask, as opposed to those students who have behavioral or sensory disorders. Again, while the case law has, is still very new in this area, there does seem to be more acceptance for enforcing mask mandates when it would not physically harm the individual to do so. And I'll turn it back over to Nina to talk to you about some of the considerations involving religious accommodations. Thanks, Sherry, and that's right. In addition to all of those disability accommodations that Sherry talked about, schools need to be prepared to address requests for exemptions for mask mandates as a religious accommodation as well. Now, you may have seen news stories um, recently about a quote, religious exemption card um, that people can purchase for $12 from a website that says, I'm exempted from wearing a mask because of my religion, and it's illegal to ask me about it, and it's illegal to enforce your mask mandate. Um, those cards are not enforceable, by the way. Um, now, we all know that in certain instances, employees, students, and even members of the public may be entitled to religious accommodations and exemptions from school policies. For example, um, Jewish employees may be entitled to um, an exemption from a rule banning the wearing of head coverings to allow them to wear a yarmulke, or Sikh students may be entitled to an exemption from the student code of conduct to allow them to carry a dagger called a kirpan, um, the wearing of which is one of the five um, tenets of Sikhism. Um, by the way, don't be too alarmed by that accommodation. Um, those accommodations generally require the dagger to be very small, with a dulled blade, and a sheath from which it can't be removed, sewn inside clothing, never displayed at school, so you know, not really presenting any level of a safety issue. Now, while schools should certainly pay attention to and analyze requests for religious accommodations on an individual basis, um, requests for exemptions from mask mandates based on religious grounds are probably not going to be required because the standards are very different than um, with disability accommodations. For employees, schools are going to need to analyze these requests under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, um, the, the, your general non-discrimination um, federal law. The analysis here is similar to the analysis under the um, Americans with Disabilities Act that Sherry had discussed earlier. An employee is entitled to a religious accommodation for a sincerely held religious belief unless the accommodation poses an undue hardship to the employer. Like with the ADA, schools should engage in an interactive process 
to analyze the request for their, a religious accommodation. And it is permissible for schools and advisable, I think, um, to, for schools to request proof of the sincerely held religious belief. Likewise, it's also permissible to consider counterfactual evidence. Um, do they wear a mask to go grocery shopping or to access public transportation or to go to a restaurant? Um, and if they do, that might cast doubt on whether you're really talking about a sincerely held religious belief after all. But let's assume that you do have a sincerely held religious belief that really does prohibit wearing of a mask. You'll next need to consider whether the proposed accommodation exemption from the mask mandate is an undue hardship. And here I think it's really important to remember what the mask mandate is for. It is not just to keep the wearer safe, it is to keep all others safe, the entire school community safe, since masks reduce COVID transmission to others. It may very well be that the risk posed by unmasked individuals, given their workspace and given the need for community safety, is an undue burden that cannot be reasonably accommodated. On the other hand, it may be possible that you as an employer can restructure your job duty so the employee in question does not ever have to be in proximity to others and can still perform the essential functions of their job. No matter what though, ensure that at every step in the process, you're documenting your process and what your outcome is. Now it's a bit more straightforward when addressing religious-based exemptions from students or members of the public. These individuals may cite Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act that deals with public accommodations, or, or maybe even they'll cite to the free exercise clause of the First Amendment of the Constitution, which protects the free exercise of religion. In these situations, a school only needs to show that its mask requirement has a rational basis and that it was not adopted with the explicit intent to interfere with a religious practice. And that's a relatively easy bar to clear. Schools that adopt mask mandates can readily point to longstanding CDC guidance and wide ranging consensus and recommendations showing the effectiveness of wearing masks in reducing transmission of COVID. And this guidance is going to form that rational basis that you need to justify your mask mandate. And frankly, I'm having a little trouble imagining a school um, intending to adopt a mask mandate for the purpose of interfering with religion. Um, and perhaps that's just a failure of my imagination, but I don't really see that being a, a realistic possibility. Again, though, if your school does receive a request for a religious accommodation from a student or a community member, Again, document your communications to articulate the reasons for the mandate. Stress that um, this is adopted based on CDC guidance and recommendations showing the effectiveness of masks and the need to keep the school community safe. Um, that it was not, and that is the only reason that, that mask mandate was adopted. Now, I do want to close with a little caveat on this conversation. Some states or cities may have mask mandates that themselves include explicit religious exemptions. Um, those mask mandates might preempt what your individual school community can do. Um, so make sure that you check those first. So that is everything you wanted to know about mandating masks. Let's move on to mandating testing. Um, so there are two main types of testing that are out there, diagnostic, and antibody tests. First, let's talk about diagnostic tests. Um, these are tests that detect an active COVID infection, and there's two types of um, diagnostic tests. The molecular test, also sometimes called a PCR test, is one of these. Um, these are done by a nose or a, th a throat swab or a nasal pharyngeal swab, which is the kind that goes a little bit further up the nose and might tickle the, your nose a little bit. Um, or via a saliva test. Um, the saliva tests are not quite as common or readily available. These are highly accurate tests at detecting the presence of a COVID infection. Um, they are sometimes referred to as the gold standard in diagnostic testing. Um, results can come back as quickly as the same day or can take as long as a week, um, depending on your geographic location and um, your lab testing capacity and lab analysis capacity. Um, these are also a little bit more expensive. The other kind of diagnostic test is the antigen test and sometimes called a rapid test. Um, these are done again via nose or nasal pharyngeal swab. 
Um, and some of these tests can provide really fast results within 15 to 30 minutes. Um, and they're significantly less expensive than PCR tests. Um, they tend to be highly accurate, a little less um, accurate than PCR tests, but um, certainly useful for detecting the presence of COVID. Now contrast those diagnostic tests, the kind that we've been talking about so far, with antibody tests. Antibody tests are typically done by a blood sample, and these tests show whether an individual has been infected by COVID in the past, not whether they are currently having an active COVID infection. They cannot and do not determine if the individual has COVID at the time of the test. And that limitation makes them of really little value for schools. Typically, it's not helpful for you to know if someone has ever had COVID in the past. Instead, it is helpful for you to know and identify those who have a current active infection so those individuals can quarantine and take other protective measures to reduce further spread. For that reason, when we discuss testing as part of this webinar, we are focused on diagnostic testing rather than antibody testing. Now, in addition to multiple types of tests that are out there, there are also multiple types of testing regimes. And Sherry is going to take you through those. Hey, everybody. So when we talk about testing regimes, I think the most important thing to consider is the need to develop your testing regime for your school or college in consultation with your local health department and to take into consideration your local levels of positive cases and transmission. As Nina will discuss in a few moments, consent is always going to be required for testing, regardless of whether it's a minor or an adult, as is the proper training and certification level for the individual that is administering the test. Now, with those thoughts in mind, let's run through some of the various options for how you can set up a testing protocol at your school and college. The first and most obvious is you can have symptom-based testing. Um, if you've got individuals, students, or employees on your campus that are showing signs or symptoms consistent with COVID-19, one option you may have would be to implement a testing regime for symptomatic individuals. Very similarly, you could have exposure-based testing. Um, that would be for individuals who you know have come into close contact with somebody who has been tested positive. Now, the CDC has great resources for schools and colleges on developing a tiered approach for testing uh, students and others who may have been exposed at school. Those strategies group individuals into tiers from those who were most likely to be exposed to those that were least likely based on their proximity and length of exposure. Likewise, the CDC has guidance on how to conduct testing protocols when you have an outbreak on your campus. And of course, anytime you have an outbreak, you need to work with your local health department. Beyond those, we also have clients, of course, that are looking at screening asymptomatic individuals. Some folks are looking at doing entry testing or universal testing for the first time that folks come back to campus. The CDC has not officially condemned that, but they have not endorsed it. This is because it's not yet known if testing of all of the staff, teachers, and students at just one point in time, which again, I'm referring to as entry testing or universal one-time testing, we don't know that that provides any substantial reduction in virus transmission above the key mitigation strategies that are already being recommended for schools. Now, the CDC, while it has not endorsed just entry-level testing for the entire workforce and, and student body, they are endorsing uh, two-phase testing or repeat testing um, if your school and college has the resources to conduct an ongoing testing strategy. Another option uh, beyond just the universal testing is to conduct randomized testing of your asymptomatic uh, workforce and student body. Um, in doing that, the CDC has recommended that you prioritize your randomized testing of teachers and faculty and staff. 
um, over students and that you prioritize your older students than your younger students. And that would obviously be much more applicable for our K-12 audience. The key to a successful random testing regime is that it be truly random and that it be conducted on a recurring basis. I wanted to take a minute to talk about a practice that was more popular at the beginning of this pandemic, and that is the idea of retesting individuals who have previously tested positive. The CDC has now come out and said that it is not recommending that schools and colleges retest individuals who have previously tested positive, but who no longer have symptoms for COVID. Um, they recommend that you not do that for a period of three months from the last positive test. And the reason for that may be obvious, but it's because we are still seeing false positives or people who continue to test positive even though they are unlikely to pose a risk for transmission and infections. Now, another really popular course of action is to have universal screening for athletes and individuals participating in high contact sporting events. Certainly, schools and colleges can determine that repeat testing or screening for student athletes is required as a condition of participating in practices and competition. Now, you'll be interested to know that the American Academy of Pediatrics does not currently recommend testing for all student athletes, while on the other hand, the NCAA does recommend testing within 72 hours of competition for high contact sports such as football, basketball, hockey, lacrosse. Uh, that means you've got discretion and professional judgment in how you want to proceed with respect to your student athletes. Just make sure to consult your athletic conference that your students are going to be participating in to make sure you follow their rules as well. And one last note on the testing regimes, make sure that you do not set up a plan where you are targeting what you would think of as high-risk individuals to be tested when you are not otherwise conducting randomized testing or you know, universal testing of all of your, your uh, employees or your students. In other words, you could be found to be discriminating against individuals if you are targeting them for testing based on their age or based on a pre-existing medical condition or a pregnancy. So be careful about that. I wanna shift and talk a little bit about what you can do in terms of mandating that a student be tested as a condition of school attendance. The question is, can you require it? Can you require these students to submit to testing in order to participate in in-person educational experiences? And the answer is going to vary depending on whether you're a private or public K-12 school or whether you're a college and university. For K-12 public schools, we do not advise this at this point in time. The reason for this is that generally speaking, most federal enforcement agencies are deferring to the CDC on whether certain interventions are legally acceptable. And therefore, it is very advisable that you stay within the CDC's recommendations. The CDC has not yet supported the mandatory testing of asymptomatic students prior to attendance at school. So without that CDC or your local health department support, public school districts should be very cautious of mandating that asymptomatic testing occur for, as a condition for attending in-person instruction. Now that does not mean that you can't mandate testing as a condition of your extracurricular participation. There is support for K-12 public school districts who wish to require mandatory testing of students as a condition of participating in strictly voluntary offerings, such as athletics. These extracurricular activities are not a part of the core academic program and have historically been subjected to additional conditions for participation, so this is not new. However, just as we've already talked about today, school districts will need to make sure that they are addressing any uh, requests for accommodations for students with disabilities. 
For example, if a student has a disability that prevents him from receiving a nasal swab test, the school district may consider a saliva-based test for that student instead. And again, do not forget that you need to obtain written parental consent to administer any testing. Now, as I mentioned, it's different for colleges and it's also different for K-12 private schools. So colleges differ from K-12 public schools because their right to attendance, a student's right to attendance in college is not an inherent right. Colleges, as we know, can set their own admissions and retention policies as long as they are not discriminatory. Therefore, if a college can demonstrate that mandatory testing regime is a reasonably necessary in order to protect the health and safety of the campus community, it is probably constitutional to require testing as a condition of either living on campus or attending on-campus instruction or on-campus events. However, as we've already talked about, there needs to be an accommodation process for students with disabilities. And you're gonna to have to determine whether it is the right approach for your campus. And that's gonna depend largely on your local culture, your local transmission rates, the nature of your campus community. Are you a largely commuter campus or do you have a primarily residential based campus community? And I do wanna caution you that if you do not have the support of your local health department, it is not wise to undertake a mandatory testing requirement for your student body. And this is because the basis for permitting the legality of this is to be able to show that it was reasonably necessary to prevent the spread of serious disease. So if your local health department does not support it, you're gonna have a hard time meeting that standard. In addition, for our private schools and for our um, public and private colleges and universities, make sure that your mandatory testing protocols are in line with your tuition contracts, your housing agreements, your student codes of conduct. Uh, you should definitely work with your legal counsel to make sure you don't have a conflict in any of your existing policies and your new testing requirements. They can help you modify those policies and advise you on whether you're safe to proceed with your testing uh, protocol. You know, one other alternative, although we are talking today about how far can you go with these mandates, one other alternative that I did want to mention is that we're seeing a lot of success from college, colleges incentivizing students to participate in testing. Um, they are offering up nominal, nominal incentives such as gift cards and things like that. I would also remind you that if you are, um, asking your student body to participate in testing, make sure that you are not then uh, penalizing them based on the outcome of the test results. And what I mean by that is if your campus has a rule, part of your code of conduct now, that students may not participate in large group gatherings, if you have a student who is tested at your insistence or your suggestion, and they test positive, then don't turn around and discipline them simply because of their test result. Nina, I'll throw it back to you to talk more about consent. Great. So that was a good overview of the kinds of testing regimes that you might want to consider. But regardless of what testing regime you adopt, um, you're going to need to consent. Simply put, if your school considers implementing any kind of assistance program, you will need to work through issues of consent. Now, your school may be in an area with a local law or ordinance that requires individuals to submit to COVID testing as a conditioning as a condition for entering school property. Um, most of us are not in that kind of area. Um, most of us do not have such uh, local law or ordinance, um, so consent remains uh, an issue. No matter what though, because COVID testing is considered to be a health procedure, you will need to obtain written informed consent. For students, that means getting consent from their parent or guardian, or if the student is over 18 and independent, the student themselves. Um, and that consent form should at a minimum contain the following information. 
first you want to have a brief description of the test um, so they know what to expect. A brief condition of how often and under what conditions the testing is going to be administered. Um, is it going to be random sampling for surveillance testing? Is it going to be testing each time an athlete attends practice or attends a game, et cetera? Um, and in the case of random testing, you'll want a statement that the parent um, or the student, if the student is an adult, is going to be notified each time the student is tested along with the statement that they will be notified of the results within a set period of time. Um, you'll want a statement that the parent can revoke their consent for testing in writing along with the designation of whom to send that written uh, revocation to and that the revocation might impact the student's ability to participate in certain school activities. For instance, if you require testing as part of um, being on uh, an athletics team or an extracurricular activity, um, you'll want to put them on notice that if they don't consent to testing, they may be barred from the activity. Um, if the school contracts with a third party provider to conduct the testing, which is very common, um, your consent form should include an authorization allowing your school and that third party provider to share and exchange all relevant information about the student, including but not limited to the results of the COVID testing. Um, and in addition, I find that it helps to um, re-emphasize the privacy protections um, that are involved from both the school's perspective and the third party provider perspective as well. We're gonna to touch on privacy in a moment. Um, and then finally, if your school wants to seek any reimbursement for testing costs from Medicaid or Medicare, um, consent, um, from the parent allowing the school to do so. Now, Sherry mentioned earlier that requiring consent for COVID testing is a condition for attending school in person, especially at the public K-12 uh, level, is tricky and not advised. Um, schools have a bit more latitude when it comes to requiring COVID testing of their employees. Um, schools as employers can require their employees to submit to COVID testing as a condition of entering the school premises. Now, that being said, that ability to require COVID testing does not remove your obligation to obtain consent. You still have to obtain the employee's written consent for testing, which is going to include um, all of the same elements for um, student testing that we talked about. But that, of course, sets up some additional considerations that each school is going to have to work through on a practical level. First, you'll still have to go through ADA or religious accommodation requests um, that we discussed earlier when it came to mask mandates. But on a more practical level, if a school requires COVID testing, you'll need to consider your plan if employees simply refuse. Um, are you going to separate them from their employment? Um, that may create some other kinds of barriers for you in achieving your mission and having an, a sufficient workforce, as well as perhaps some reputational um, damage you might take in that instance. Um, alternatively, will you simply place them on remote work status? Um, that creates another kind of operational issue that may not be workable for you. Um, so each school is going to have to balance those considerations carefully to make sure that any testing regime and any requirement surrounding testing is going to be practically feasible for you in light of your school community. It may be that your school determines that it's just not practical or doable to require COVID testing of its staff and instead simply opt to strongly encourage participation. Um, now, one key element to getting good participation in any COVID uh, testing plan, in addition to being a legal requirement, of course, um, is to articulate and implement strong confidentiality provisions. Um, we are gonna talk about those a little bit later in this webinar, so stay tuned for that. So now that we've talked about mandating masks, mandating tests, let's go to mandating vaccines. Um, so currently there are two vaccines on the market. We'll touch on them briefly. I think we all feel like sort of amateur epidemiologists after a year of, of working through COVID. Um, but currently we've got two vaccines with emergency um, use authorization. Pfizer and Moderna both require two doses spaced between three and four weeks apart, depending on the vaccine. Um, and those vaccines reach their, um, their high of efficacy rate about two weeks after the second dose. So potentially, you know, six weeks or so, 
before you get to actual um, efficacy and actual immunity. Um, there is a potential third vaccine on the horizon, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, it does have some advantages that the others don't. It's a single dose, um, and it doesn't require ultra-cold storage, so it's easier to ship and store, um, but it also seems to be a little bit less effective overall. Um, that being said, um, while it's not effective in preventing COVID, it seems to have a 100% efficacy rate in preventing hospitalization and death, so that's great news. Um, we're also hearing news reports that perhaps those who have already had COVID need only one dose of the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine rather than the two do doses. So that potentially um, increases our supply available. And we're also hearing that perhaps people can wait longer between doses so we can further stretch supply and get more people um, with their first dose and give manufacturers time to um, speed up their um, manufacturing process and distribute the second doses. The bottom line is that the vaccine landscape and the science around it is changing rapidly, as is everything else with COVID. Um, and that's going to have impacts on how you um, approach the question of mandating vaccines. I'm going to throw it back to Sherry um, to talk about um, considerations with employees. So by now, you all have probably heard that the EEOC has come out and has said that employers can mandate COVID-19 vaccinations so long as certain exceptions are made for individuals with disabilities or for those that need religious accommodations. There's a lot of confusion about that, so I wanted to break it down for you. Please understand that the EEOC is only speaking with respect to the federal employment laws that it enforces. It is not weighing in on other laws, such as state laws, local laws, employment contracts, or the impact of such a decision on a school or college's immunity defenses. Um, we're going to talk about the PREP Act in just a few minutes, and the, your PREP Act immunity could be impacted if you mandate a vaccine with only emergency use authorization. Um, again, Nina will talk about the PrEP Act in just a minute, but as background, the current Moderna and Pfizer vaccines have only received emergency use authorizations or EUAs from the Food and Drug Administration. They have not been fully approved by the FDA at this point. This is important for you because the EUAs that were issued for these two vaccines specifically conditioned their use on the vaccine provider giving notice to the individual that's being vaccinated prior to them getting that vaccination that they or their caregiver has the option to accept or refuse the vaccine. So what does this mean? As a practical matter, the FDA is not an employment agency, and schools and colleges should be able to rely on the EEOC's guidance permitting mandatory vaccination programs, at least on a federal level. However, in the event that a school or college administers the vaccines and wishes to be covered by PrEP Act immunity, you may risk that coverage if you mandate employees be vaccinated when there are only vaccines on the market that have been issued EUAs and not full FDA approval. In addition, I would caution you that the EEOC is relying heavily on the CDC and that guidance is consistently being updated and changed. So you should continue to monitor this and work with your legal counsel. Nina's gonna talk to you about some local considerations and NLRA considerations. So while the EEOC is currently taking the position that federal employment laws don't prohibit employers from implementing mandatory vaccine programs for employees, school districts um, and colleges and universities need to consult their state laws as well. There are currently several states who have passed or are considering legislation that would ban employers from mandating that employees be vaccinated. So you want to be um, be clear on what the landscape is where you are. Additionally, school districts and colleges with a unionized labor force will need to take into consideration the National Labor Relations Act or the NLRA 
mandatory testing or vaccine programs um, are going to need to be negotiated with those unions through their collective bargaining agreements or their CBAs. Additionally, there is the possibility of workers' compensation exposure for employees that have an adverse health reaction when taking a mandated vaccine. So schools should work with their um, legal counsel to consult their state workers' compensation schemes to make sure you understand your exposure potentially there in the event that you mandate vaccines for your um, employees. Now, there are a few other um, compliance issues when it comes to potentially uh, mandating vaccines for your employees, and I'm going to turn it over to Sherry to pick those up. So, you know, we can't talk about mandated testing or vaccination programs for employees without mentioning the Fair Labor Standards Act. And I will just briefly remind you that anytime you suffer or permit an employee to work, you are required to pay them. So your exempt employees should already be being paid and you should not dock them for time spent on a mandatory uh, employer required uh, testing or vaccination program. Your non-exempt employees, your hourly employees, you're gonna need to make sure that they record their hours worked and that they are paid. I wanna switch uh, quickly to talk about another consideration with the Americans with Disabilities Act. And this deals with the ADA's prohibition against disability-related inquiries. So according to the CDC, and this makes sense, right guys? Healthcare providers should ask certain questions before administering a vaccine to ensure that there is no medical reason that the individual should not be vaccinated. If the school or college mandates that the vaccine uh, must be taken by the employees and the school or college administers the vaccine directly, either by themselves or through a third party contracted provider, then these pre-vaccination medical screening questions will likely violate the ADA prohibition on disability-related inquiries. So what do we do about that? There are ways to alleviate that concern and still be in compliance. First, you can make the vaccinations voluntary. And if you make them voluntary, then you can ask the employee to voluntarily answer those pre-screening questions. Of course, if they don't answer the question, you would not administer the vaccine and you would be cautioned not to retaliate, uh, harass, or otherwise intimidate the employee on their, on their question. Now, for those schools and colleges that are still going to mandate vaccines, you can get around this prohibition problem by instructing your employees to obtain the vaccinations from truly independent third parties that do not have contracts with the school or college to administer the vaccine. In other words, send them to the pharmacy, public health department, or their doctor. Um, I'm gonna turn it back to Nina now to talk about some of the considerations involving mandating students to be vaccinated. So when it comes to students, we're really talking about um, very different territory, both legally and practically. Um, we are in the earliest stages of vaccine distribution, such that it's not available for most students who are old enough to receive it. Um, heck, it's not even available for most adults who are old enough to receive it. Um, and there is no vaccine currently authorized at any level for children under the age of 16. So when we talk about mandating vaccines, we are very much speaking in the theoretical and preparing for some unknown time in the future when a vaccine is both authorized and readily available. For colleges and universities, vaccines are approved for the vast, vast majority of your student body, not available to them. Eventually, though, there will be enough supply um, such that it is um, available, just like the measles or the flu vaccine. Um, some public, some colleges and universities may have state laws that dictate what that, um, vaccines can be mandated for students, but if you get to decide on your own, you do have the authority to mandate the COVID vaccine of your student body, just like you have the authority to require other vaccines um, subject to your notice provision to your um, school community. Keep in mind though, the nugget that Sherry mentioned about emergency youth authorization, both current vaccines only have that emergency use authorization. So until they're fully approved, colleges and universities who decide to mandate the COVID vaccine may be risking immunity that they might otherwise enjoy under the PrEP Act, which I promise we're gonna get, gonna get to in just a second. 
And of course, each college university is going to need to determine, consistent with their state laws, what sorts of exemptions to vaccine requirements it will allow, such as medical, religious, or philosophical objections. For K-12 students, however, state laws and health regulations, by and large, determine which vaccines you can require of your students. And um, we still have quite some time to go before any COVID vaccine is approved, even on an emergency basis for most of our K-12 students. Um, given that we don't foresee any realistic possibility for any kind of vaccine mandate, um, even possibly for the 22-23 school year. Now, we have mentioned the PrEP Act many times, and we do want to spend a few minutes going through it. Um, the PrEP Act is the Public Readiness and Emergency Preparedness Act. That's what PrEP stands for. And it provides complete immunity from liability when the Secretary for Health and Human Services determines the existence of a public health emergency and issues a declaration regarding covered countermeasures. Now, that's a little bit of a word salad, so let's break it down. We are in a public health emergency right now that has been declared. So um, we are in the realm of PREP Act um, activity. And what the PREP Act provides is immunity for liability when individuals um, administer covered countermeasures um, consistent with HHS or Health and Human Services guidance. Covered countermeasures are those approved interventions to combat a, uh, combat a pandemic. In this case, covered countermeasures for COVID-19 include drug therapeutic treatments, vaccines, and diagnostic tests. So the tests that detect the presence of coronavirus, um, as well as COVID vaccines, are considered covered countermeasures. So essentially, under the PREP Act, when a qualified individual administers a test or administers a vaccine, they are immune from liability under the PREP Act. Um, often it is healthcare professionals that um, rely on PrEP Act immunity, those doctors and nurses and other healthcare providers that are actually providing the testing, that are actually providing the vaccines and treatment. But schools, colleges, and uh, some colleges and universities do operate their own health centers and provide direct healthcare services that could also qualify for PrEP Act immunity. But even when they don't have their own standing healthcare centers, um, K-12 schools, colleges, and universities can also enjoy PrEP Act community in two main ways. First, if a school provides facilities for COVID testing or vaccination, the school, as well as its employees, can be immune from liability. In this scenario, the school would be referred to as a program planner. For instance, if you've made your campus available for a mass vaccination event or a mass testing site, mass testing site your school could be considered a program planner under the PREP Act and immune from liability. Second, a school can enter in a, into an agreement with their applicable local board of public health um, where you're located. And that agreement can provide that school nurses or other qualified personnel are acting under the direction of the board of public health to administer COVID testing or vaccines. In this scenario, the school district, as well as its employees, would be considered, quote, a qualified person under the PrEP Act and would be immune from liability. And that immunity extends to the entity, the school itself, as well as its employees, officials, agents, contractors, and volunteers. So when we're talking about immunity, what are we really talking about? Um, what the PrEP Act provides for is immunity from both federal and state law claims of loss that are caused by or arise out of or relate to the administration of a count covered countermeasure. So for instance, if you're having a mass vaccination event on your campus and someone has an adverse reaction to the vaccine, um, you would be immune from any personal injury or medical malpractice claims that would arise out of the administration of the vaccine. Now there are some limits to PrEP Act activity First, the immunity only applies to claims that are related to the administration of the COVID intervention, like the COVID test or a vaccine. Um, and that, that's pretty broad in and of itself. So those claims include death, physical or mental or emotional injury, illness, disability, condition, fear of physical or mental or emotional injury, um, or even the need for medical monitoring. Um, so for instance, 
an adverse reaction to a vaccine would be covered, but a school district could not use the PREP Act to provide immunity for unrelated claims such as employment discrimination claims or disability discrimination claims. Additionally, there's no immunity when a serious physical injury results due to willful misconduct. Now, willful misconduct requires um, intentionally doing something wrong to achieve a wrongful purpose and knowingly without legal or factual justification and in disregard of a known or obvious risk to the person. Now that is an extremely high standard. So the likelihood of willful misconduct occurring is very low. Um, so the PrEP Act immunity is going to be intact. That being said, of course, you wanna make sure that everyone who is involved in COVID testing, involved in vaccination um, is acting in good faith. So what does all this mean for a school's vaccination and testing program? A school can institute those kinds of programs while taking, taking advantage, pardon me, of PrEP Act immunity in two ways. First, you can provide physical space um, to allow a medical provider or your public health department to administer a testing or vaccination program. Alternatively, you could enter into a direct agreement with your local board of public health to um, administer testing or administer vaccination. Of course, you need to make sure that you're following the testing protocols correctly, that you're following vaccination protocols correctly, including those involved in the emergency use author authorizations that Sherry mentioned. And with that, we're gonna close with the topic of confidentiality um, regarding, you know, we're talking about healthcare and medical information. So confidentiality is top of mind. And Sherry's gonna close us out with that. You can't be in the education profession without knowing about FERPA and HIPAA and all of the confidentiality and privacy requirements that uh, impact our employees and our students. Just from a very high level standpoint, Remember that for our employees under the ADA, schools and colleges must maintain all of their medical information that we learn about the employee, and that would include any COVID diagnosis, any temperature readings, any test results, vaccination history. All of that must be kept as a confidential medical record separate and apart from the employee's general personnel file. Uh, in addition to those federal requirements, you should check with your state and local laws to make sure that there are no other additional requirements for record keeping and confidentiality. Of course, you cannot release this information to third parties without the appropriate consent or being legally compelled to do so by court order or a subpoena. Um, there are times when you can report information about a positive employee diagnosis to your local health department and when you can communicate that on a very limited basis to the necessary and appropriate school officials that are needed in order to follow that health department's guidance. But in general, you should not be reporting anything about an individual employee um, to the public. You can handle all of your contract tracing requirements by simply talking about an individual in a department or your dorm or your class has tested positive for COVID and you may have been closely exposed. Now for students, they are obviously covered by FERPA in the public realm um, for K-12 students and then for any colleges and universities that accept federal funding. We all know that FERPA prohibits the release of personally identifiable information unless there are certain exceptions. Now, there is an exception for health and safety emergencies that allow schools to release individual identifiable information about a student to necessary third parties during an existing emergency if that's necessary to protect the health and safety of others. Um, again, that would be the health department or a medical official, not the public or college or, or fellow students. If you do release information to the health department or a medical professional, you must maintain records about the reason for the release and who you release the information to. And only in a very rare situation would you meet the criteria 
for needing to release the personally identifiable identifiable information about a student to others. Again, you can generally handle your contact tracing and your notice requirements from a more generic standpoint. There is also HIPAA. HIPAA does not always apply to the topics that we've addressed today. It will depend largely on who is administering and paying for the test or vaccine. But you can comply with HIPAA the same way that you comply with the ADA and with FERPA, which means you keep an individual student or employee's information confidential and only release general information about an anonymous employee testing positive. Nina, I'll throw it back to you to wrap us up. Well, I see that we're a few minutes over time. Um, thank you everyone for attending today. I know we covered a lot of information and we covered it pretty quickly. Um, like I said at the beginning, this webinar is being recorded, so it will be available to you after today. Um, and I just want to close by saying, you know, we here at Nelson Mullins, we have a robust education practice supporting private and public schools, um, K-12, colleges and universities across the country. And if there's anything that we can do to help you with your response to COVID-19 or any other areas of your legal need, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, our contact information is included on this slide. Um, you can also certainly feel free to email directly myself or Sherry um, at any time. And if you have any questions, um, please feel free to send us those questions as well. And we're happy to help you any way that we can. Um, and everyone, um, it has been a crazy year. Um, I'm hopeful that we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel um, and this will be over before we know it. Um, but this is our new normal and um, you know, congratulations to all of you for navigating through such an unprecedented um, and, and, and unique time. We're, we're all doing great under the circumstances, even not under the circumstances. So hang in there. We're all going to get to the other side together. Thanks, everyone, and have a wonderful day.